Thank you, Elder. It's a blessing to be here with you. Amen. I um, want to give God thanks for his continued blessing. Uh, the last time I was here, I don't think you had so many people. So um, it's a sign of God's blessing. Praise Amen. God. I want to um, say thank you to your pastor, Pastor Thomas, um, a good man. Pastor Thomas, we uh, cherish his ministry there at the conference. We pray for all our, uh, our ministers. And um, Pastor Thomas and his family are indeed one of those pastors within the conference that we hold in high regard. Uh, pray for your ministers. Give good counsel. Uh, and you'll get the best from your ministers. I want to bring to us a word of encouragement today. I've entitled the uh, presentation's priority while we wait. Priorities while we wait. Uh, perhaps one of the most frustrating uh, lessons that we have to learn as human beings is having to wait. When you're in a hurry to get to your destination and you have to wait for public transport, it can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. When you have to catch a plane and there is a delay, there is a frustrating experience. When as young people growing up and they want things, they want things now, they cannot wait, and if you tell them to wait a little, it seems like waiting an eternity. Waiting is a difficult lesson to learn. In fact, it is only children of faith that can really exercise what it means, the patience of waiting on God. Because to wait lies beyond the vision of the present. Waiting means expecting something somewhere in the future that perhaps may or may not come. That's where faith comes in. Waiting is a, is a teasing word. You know, the Bible gives several examples of individuals who've had to learn this lesson of waiting. You remember the story of Noah. He had to preach and build at the same time. The Bible says, for a hundred years old man was saying, there must be some truth in it. But sin, my friends, has a way of hardening our hearts. And even though these things were taking place before them, they still refused to respond to God's call of mercy. But at the appointed time, Noah, his sons and his daughters-in-law and his wife entered the ark and the door was shut. Day one came and passed, as did day two. I don't know whether you have experienced what it's like being in a confined space with animals. Can you imagine the stench of that place? Can you imagine trying to sleep at night and all these noise that the animals made? It wasn't a very comfortable place. But day three came and passed, and day four also came and passed. And Noah, his sons, his daughters-in-law, and his wife had to wait on the Lord. You can imagine the laughter and the ridiculing that was taken place by the antediluvian world. The fifth day came and passed, and the sixth, and even the seventh day came and passed. And Noah 
and his family were still waiting in the yard. I can imagine his sons coming to him and asking him, Dad, are you really sure you heard the voice of God? But as the word of God had said, it was after the seventh day the heavens became dark and clouds came together and there was an outpouring of rain and the antediluvian world were destroyed. When God speaks, things happen. And Noah and his family endured the waiting period. You will remember the story of Sarah and Abraham. In fact, her name was Sarai. And Abram was his name. Although they received a promise from God that Sarah would have a child. She had passed the age of childbearing. And this couple had to wait 25 years. Now, even though God had changed their names from Sarai to Sarah, a princess, and Abram to Abraham, a father of a multitude. Yet they hadn't seen the fulfillment of God's promise. 25 years of waiting. And they tried to help God fulfill his plans. And you know the problems that came about as a result of trying to help God. Let me say for us that if we have been praying for our children, or we have been praying for a loved one, maybe a month has passed, or two months has passed, let me advise us, continue praying and waiting on God. Amen. Sometimes it takes 25 years, like Abraham and Sarah, for God's word to come to pass. Yeah. But when God speaks, things happen. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Sarah, at a ripe old age, gave birth to the promised son. Mm -hmm. God's yeah. word will come to pass. <laughs> we can talk about Jacob learning to wait. He had to wait seven years to marry the person who he thought was his desire. Only to be tricked and having to work another seven years, 14 years before he could marry the woman that he wanted. Then there is the story of Moses, this great prince, who thought he also could help God. And when he discovered that God does not deal with human beings murdering someone else in order to fulfill his plans. Moses had to flee for his life. He went into the Midian mountains. It was there that God had to teach him what it means to wait on the Lord. For 40 long years, Moses had to learn what it means to wait on God. So now he was 80 years of age. God says, you are now ready. You have learned what it means to wait on me. The Bible is replete with several examples of individuals learning to wait on the Lord. This, this lesson of waiting on God is something that each one of us must experience for ourselves. You cannot experience it for your spouse. Neither can you experience it for your children. God is taking each one of us through a journey of what it means to wait on the Lord. It is no wonder that the psalmist writes in the 62nd division of the Psalms, verses 5 through 8, the psalmist writes, My soul, 
wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. I want you to notice how David says we ought to wait. We are to wait as those who expect something from our God. And David says, because my expectation is from him, I shall not be moved. My brothers and my sisters, when God says something, we can rest upon his promise that God will bring to fulfillment his word. Well, Matthew 25 records a parable about a group of young ladies who were waiting for the bridegroom. In the East, wedding festivities take place in the evening. The bridegroom leaves his home and makes his way to the home of the bride where there is a bridal party awaiting him. He will then take his bride and the bridal party will follow and will escort them to the bridegroom's home where the festivities will take place. These young women, according to the parable that Jesus gives, these young women were waiting anxiously for the appearance of the bridegroom. But there is a delay. And Jesus uses this parable to teach us that it is absolutely imperative for us, his church, to be ready for his return. Jesus says, Blessed is the servant whom, when his Lord cometh, shall find so doing. So what are our priorities as we await the second coming of our Lord? In the few moments that we will share together, let me put before us three priorities that I want to submit to us. Priority number one. As a people anticipating the second advent of our Lord, I suggest that we ought to be a people of faith. Faith is a priority for us to exercise as we await his second coming. Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Some time ago in your journey with God, the Lord met you. You fell in love with the Savior. You embraced him as your personal Savior. And you began to look forward to his soon return. As Adventists, we believe that Jesus entered the second and final phase of his heavenly ministry in 1844. And some have asked this question. If Jesus really began his final phase of ministry in heaven, October 22nd, 1844, what is keeping him so long? Why hasn't he returned? Why the delay? Can we keep on preaching Jesus is coming soon? 
you would appreciate that after 160 or so years of preaching this message, the word soon begins to lose its significance. <laughs> Is Jesus really coming again soon? Well, let me share with you what Peter has to say about this. According to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 onwards, the Bible says, we ought to know this first, that the, in the last days there shall come scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. He goes on to say, verses 8 and 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Then he concludes by saying this, but the day of the Lord will come. Amen. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, it takes faith to still believe in the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, many have turned their backs on this wonderful truth. Even though Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place and I will come again. Because there is a delay, some have turned their backs on God. But Paul Peter tells us that it is out of mercy that God is delayed. Because some of us are not ready for him to return again. This is the time for us to ensure that our calling and election is certain. And so God's delay is an act of mercy for us. You know how it was with the Hebrews as they left Egypt. Some historians tell us that at least a million left Egypt en route to the promised land. What should have taken them just a few weeks ended up taking 40 long years. Now, the servant of the Lord writes and tells us why this delay happened. She says, for 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sin has delayed the entrance of modern Israel to the heavenly Canaan. In neither case, she goes on to write, were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, the unconsecration, and the strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. It was God's intention to take his people from Egyptian captivity straight to the promised land. But because of the murmuring, because of the strife, in fact, we don't have to look at ancient Israel. We just have to look at ourselves and the condition of our church. Amen. When we see the murmurings going on, and I've pastored a number of churches to know that murmuring exists. In fact, it is plaguing our churches. Murmuring.
things of all kinds go on in our church. The prophet says it is because of the murmurings, the unbelief, the strife. When it, when it comes to nominating committee time, the strife among the people of God. This is what's keeping us here these years. There are those who feel and believe that they deserve a certain position and woe be unto us if they don't get that. The problems, the strife going on, brother, not speaking to brother and sister, fighting against sister. The strife among the people of God is keeping us here. But she says it is the unbelief. Uh, this is the big thing. Unbelief is the lack of faith. Because believing in God's word and acting upon God's word. That's what faith is. It's, it's not merely an intellectual assent to the truth that, well, the word of God is true. No, because, as the Bible says, the devil believes also and trembles. But faith, my friends, is believing the word of God and ordering your life, acting in accordance with that sacred word. So we can't just believe the truth that Jesus is coming. We ought to order our lives in accordance to that truth. If Jesus is coming soon, then my conduct ought to be as though he is coming. Is Jesus really coming soon? Yes, he's coming soon. A thousand times, yes, Jesus is coming. In fact, the very delay is a fulfillment of that prophecy. The very delay that we're experiencing ought to tell us that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus. So when we talk to our work colleagues, that Jesus is coming again. When we share with our colleagues at the university or at the college or at school and they mock us and ridicule us, remember the words of Peter in the last days scoffers will come saying, where is the promise of his coming? My brothers and my sisters, we are a people of God. We are anticipating, we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why we are called Seventh-day Adventists. We are Adventists because we are anticipating the second coming of Jesus Christ. We are Seventh-day Adventists because whereas Protestantism today rejects the Sabbath commandment, our name is a constant rebuke that the seventh day Sabbath is still holy and God still expects his creatures to observe the Sabbath. We are Seventh day Adventist Christians. It's a royal name given by God himself. Is Jesus really coming again? Yes, he's coming again. And one of our priorities while we await his coming is that of faith. God's people must be a people of faith as we look forward to his second coming. But as we continue on this parable, the Bible goes on to say all this vir these virgins who had received invitations, 
they make themselves ready for the coming of the bridegroom. But there was a delay. The bridegroom tarried. And so the parable, according to Jesus, goes on to say, they all slept. That's significant. Because there are some who like to boast and say, well, the church is sleeping, but we are a, a small group that are awake and alert and, and, and watching. No, the parable says, all slept. So, so, so let none start to boast and say, I am holier than thou. Because according to the parable, the entire church was sleeping. It was at midnight, a time that nobody suspected or expected. At midnight, a cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then the Bible tells us that all of the virgins arose and began to train their lamps. That's the uh, second priority that I want to submit to us. As a people, we ought to have the oil of the Holy Spirit. You see, the, 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 the wise, when they heard that the bridegroom was coming, got up just as the foolish and began to trim their lamps. As they were there together, it's very difficult to distinguish between the wise and the foolish. So it is in the church of God. You cannot distinguish the wise from the foolish. It's a matter of the heart. During the summertime, when the trees are, are all green and lush and the flowers are just blooming and everything looks so nice, you cannot tell the difference between the evergreens and those which fade. It is when the autumn comes, when the weather changes, then you can see that the leaves on some of these trees begin to turn brown and wither and die. But the evergreens remain evergreens. So it is with the church of God. We all come to church of God and, uh, and we know the right things to say. We dress a, a certain way and, and everything seems to be well. It is when the problems come, when adversity comes, when the persecution or the, the atmosphere changes, then you can detect the genuine from the false. It, it is at that time that people begin to speak and display their true characteristics. And you will think to yourself, but I thought this person was a committed Christian. It is only during difficult times that we show our true character. Well, the foolish turn to their wise counterparts and say to them, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. The wise respond, not so, lest there be insufficient for us and yourself. But rather, go to those who sell and purchase for yourself. My brothers and my sisters, if you don't have a relationship with God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the delay is your opportunity to purchase the extra oil. Oh yes, the delay is an act of mercy on God's part. If the Lord had come when it was time to come, five would be ready and the other would not be ready. But God in his mercy has delayed so that we can get our lives in order. And so the foolish, they see that the wise are sleeping. And guess what? They also go to sleep. That's why you must not look at other brothers or sisters in the church. 
they will lead you astray. Look to Jesus and only Jesus. Ensure that you have the oil of the Holy Spirit. Enjoy your communion with the Spirit of God. Have an active and intimate relationship with the Lord. That's what distinguishes the wise from the foolish. And so, when the cry was made that the Lord was coming, the foolish ones turn to the wise and they take the advice of the wise. But I want to let you know that the wise were not being selfish. But by saying to us, we can't give you our oil. Rather, you go and secure your own oil. There is a, a lesson for us in that. The Bible says we must taste and see that the Lord is good. You cannot taste for your spouse. You, you cannot taste for your children. We all have to taste for ourselves. So if you know you haven't tasted, the delay is an opportunity for you and I to go and taste and see that the Lord is good. And so because there was this delay, because the foolish did not have extra oil in their lamps, they had to go to the marketplace to buy for themselves. It was while they went, the bridegroom came. And when the bridegroom came, those who were ready, the Bible says, went in with the Lord. But the foolish came back sometime afterwards and started knocking, Lord, Lord, open to us. The response of the Lord was significant. He said to the foolish, depart from me, I don't know you. That's the third priority that we ought to take. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Do I know him? You know, when, when, when people have an intimate relationship, they drop formalities. They, 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 they even have special names, names of endearment for one another. That's what God wants to have with us. God wants to have an intimate relationship with us. So, can you imagine when the Lord returns, because we have this intimate relationship, God will look at us and call us by our pet names. And say, I know you. Come, enter into the joy of the Lord. Because we have taken time during this delay to walk with him, to get to know him. And as he reveals himself to us, because of this delay, we have seized the opportunity. We know him. And he knows us. When he comes, he will not say to us, depart from me, for I don't know you. My brothers and my sisters, the delay is an opportunity for us to go in. So what are our priorities? Number one, we ought to be people of faith as we wait his second coming, which means taking the word of God, the promises of God, believing and trusting in them. Second priority, we must have the oil of the Holy Spirit. There ought to be sweet communion with our God. Priority number three, we ought to know him intimately and personally. Is Jesus coming again? Oh yes, he's coming again. And the signs are fast fulfilling, indicating 
his second coming. The greater sign is the delay. Because within this delay, he predicted that there will be a delay. But during this delay, there will be a time when a cry is made. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And because we have the oil of the Holy Spirit, we can trim our lamps and go out and meet him in peace. I want to pray this afternoon. I want to pray for someone who wishes to seize this opportunity to make their calling an election show. Maybe you have given your life to him a long time ago. That's all right. Because even the foolish virgins receive the invitation and they have their lamps, but they have no extra oil. It is possible to be a member of this church, but devoid of oil. Maybe you haven't given your life to Jesus, but today, after hearing the Spirit of God speaking to your heart, reminding you that Jesus is coming soon, you want to say, God, as you have delayed, let me seize this opportunity and make my calling and election sure. Is, is, there, is there someone who would want to say, please pray for me because I want to make my calling and election sure. Let's bow our heads right now and close our eyes. This is between you and God. Nobody else needs to see. The Lord has delayed his coming. There are some who have turned their backs on God because of this delay. But Peter tells us, God is not slack concerning his promises, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but he wants us all to come to repentance. Today, my first appeal to those who need to come to repentance. Are you here today? Do you want to say, Pastor, please pray for me? Because I want to meet Jesus in peace. Won't you raise your hand if that's you? And let the angels of God take note of your hand and your commitment. This is your commitment to God. God bless you. The rest of you, your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. As individuals are making their commitment to God. I have a second appeal. And that's to those who have already given their lives to Jesus, but like the foolish virgins, they don't have that extra oil. And today you want to say, you don't wish to be classified among the foolish virgins, who when the Lord comes, they'll have to go and look to purchase extra oil. But today, whilst we have the opportunity, today, you want to say, I want the Spirit of God in my life to lead my life. I need that extra oil. Today, are you here? Just raise your hand. Because the Bible says, come, ye who have no money, come and pay and, and purchase this oil. It's going to be given free by God himself. God bless you. Father, behold your children. There are some here who haven't given their lives to you. Know that they need more of your spirit in their lives. They know that they need the extra oil. Please, Father, behold your children. Bless them, I pray. Pour out your spirit upon them. Because the Bible says, Jesus himself says, if we, sinful though we may be, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall our Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Yes. Father, today I'm asking for the Spirit of God to come into my heart. 
these your children here are also raising their hands asking for the Spirit of God to come into their heart. Thank you because you will hear our prayer. Thank you because you will give us of your Spirit. And then there were those, Father, who raised their hands first, haven't given their lives to Jesus, but today they want to make a commitment to you. Oh God, come into each life. Because none of us want to be lost when Jesus comes. We want to make our commitment to you now so that we will be at peace. The Bible says, now, if you shall hear his heart, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. I commit each person to you now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.